All right, so today we're going to um, dive deep into the world of anti-aging and performance-enhancing drugs. Okay. Specifically, we're looking at Chapter 6 of this medical textbook, all about care for aging athletes. Interesting. Yeah. It's um, it's all about, you know, testosterone and resveratrol and growth hormone. Oh, wow. Yeah, the, the whole... The whole shebang. That's that's a really fascinating area, especially given your interest in, you know, optimizing performance as we age. Totally. There's yeah. so much hype around these substances, right? Like yeah. everyone's talking about you know, reclaiming their youth and pushing their athletic boundaries. And I don't know. I'm I'm always a little skeptical. Right. So I'm really curious to you know separate the fact from fiction. Absolutely. And that's that's what this deep dive is all about. You know, exploring the science behind these substances, their potential benefits, their risks. And yeah, maybe even uncovering a few surprises along the way. OK, cool. So let's um, let's start with testosterone. OK. Now, I know most people think of testosterone mm -hmm. and they immediately think of like bodybuilders, you know, getting super jacked. Right. But it actually plays a crucial role for all of us as we get older. Absolutely. You're right. It's it's not just about building muscle. Mm. Testosterone is essential for both men and women, although men naturally have much higher levels. Okay. And and the interesting thing is that testosterone levels start to decline as we age, sometimes even as early as our 30s. Our 30s? Wow, that seems pretty young to be dealing with, like, declining hormones. Yeah. Is this Is this drop in testosterone similar to what women experience with menopause. It is. It's similar in the sense that it's a natural hormonal shift that comes with age. Gotcha. In men, it's often called andropause. Andropause. Andropause, yeah. Oh, okay. And it can bring about a whole range of changes just like menopause does for women. So so what kind of changes are we talking about here? Well, physically, you might notice things like decreased muscle mass and strength, an increase in body fat, particularly around the midsection, yeah. and even a lower libido. Okay, so not exactly a, uh, a rosy picture of aging? No, not really. Are there any other impacts? I mean, beyond the physical stuff, does it affect you know, anything else? Unfortunately, yes. Studies have shown that low testosterone can also be linked to cognitive decline, a higher risk of heart issues and insulin resistance, and even a higher mortality rate. Whoa. Okay, so low testosterone is linked to all of these negative things. Yeah. It's Does a... it make sense to just supplement it then? I mean, could that be the key to feeling younger and healthier as we age? It's a tempting thought, right? Yeah. And there have been quite a few studies looking into whether testosterone supplementation can turn back the clock, so to speak. Yeah. And some of the results are pretty intriguing. Interesting. For instance, studies have shown that testosterone supplementation can lead to Increased muscle mass, stronger bones, improved mood, and even better cognitive function. So there's actual scientific evidence to support the idea that it could have like a positive impact. Yeah. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. And in fact, back in 2006, the Endocrine Society even came out with practice guidelines that recommended testosterone replacement therapy for men with clinically low testosterone levels. Huh. It makes you wonder if there's some truth to the whole like fountain of youth idea. Right. But you mentioned earlier that there are two signs to every coin. Yeah. So what about the potential risks of testosterone supplementation? You're right. It's definitely not a risk-free endeavor. Okay. While there can be benefits, there are also potential complications to consider. So what are some of the concerns people should be aware of? Well, one of the biggest concerns with testosterone therapy is the potential impact on the prostate. Okay. There are also possible cardiovascular risks, and it could even worsen sleep apnea in some cases. Gotcha. It's definitely not a one-size-fits-all solution, and it's crucial to have a doctor monitor your treatment and tailor it to your individual needs. Yeah, for sure. So it's not just as simple as popping a pill and, no. you know, suddenly you're 20 again. Yeah. There's a lot to consider, and getting medical guidance is absolutely key. Absolutely. Hormones are powerful things, and messing with their balance can have ripple effects throughout the body. For sure. Okay, so let's... um. Let's move on from testosterone and talk about something a little more, shall we say, enjoyable. Okay. Resveratrol. Okay. You know that compound found in red wine yeah. that everyone's always raving about? Yeah. Yes, the famous French paradox molecule. Right. It's definitely captured people's imagination. But to be precise, resveratrol is a polyphenol found in plants. Okay. It basically acts as a natural defense mechanism against environmental stress. Interesting. So it helps plants deal with tough conditions. Right. But does that really translate to any benefits for us humans? That's a great question. And while we can't necessarily extrapolate 
plant benefits directly to humans, there's definitely some evidence to suggest that resveratrol might offer some health benefits. Oh. Like you mentioned, there's the French paradox, right. where the French population seems to have a lower rate of heart disease despite a diet that's often high in saturated fat. Yeah. And some researchers believe that resveratrol, particularly from red wine, could be playing a role. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But does the science actually back up all the hype surrounding resveratrol, or is it just clever marketing? There have definitely been some fascinating findings. Okay. For example, studies have shown that resveratrol has anti-inflammatory and cardioprotective properties. Uh -huh. There's even research suggesting potential anti-cancer benefits. One study found that resveratrol protected proteins from degradation even when exposed to harmful glucocorticoids, which are steroid hormones. Uh -huh. This finding hints at the potential for resveratrol to protect muscles. Wow, that sounds pretty impressive. Yeah. It's almost starting to sound like a miracle cure. Hold on, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Okay. While these findings are promising, it's important to remember that a lot of the research has been conducted on animals. Right. Human trials are still limited. Okay. And we need more research to determine what dosage is effective and what the long-term effects might be in humans. Mm, gotcha. It's always good to be a bit skeptical, especially when it comes to, you know, big health claims. Absolutely. Are there any downsides to resveratrol? Any risks to consider? Well, some formulations of resveratrol supplements can have cytotoxic effects, meaning they can be toxic to cells. Mm. And resveratrol may interact negatively with certain medications. Okay, so it's not completely without risk. Mm -hmm. It sounds like moderation and careful consideration are key here. Absolutely. And speaking of things that require a balanced approach, let's move on to another hormone that often gets misunderstood. Okay. Growth hormone. You mean the one everyone associates with like growing taller during childhood? Exactly. Yeah. But growth hormone is more than just a height booster and its levels naturally decline as we get older, just like testosterone. Okay. So it's not just about how tall you are. Right. What other roles does growth hormone play in the body? Well, growth hormone is actually involved in a whole bunch of crucial processes, including metabolism, cell growth, and tissue repair. So as its levels decline with age, we start to see changes like decreased muscle mass, increased body fat, thinner skin, and even potential impacts on bone density. So it sounds like growth hormone is pretty important for, you know, just maintaining our overall health and well-being as we age. Absolutely. It definitely plays a significant role. And there have been some really interesting studies looking into the effects of growth hormone treatment in older adults. Like what have they found? While some studies have shown that growth hormone therapy can lead to an increase in lean body mass, a reduction in fat mass improvements in skin thickness, and even potential cognitive benefits. There was even one study where men aged 65 to 88 saw improvements in their body composition after receiving growth hormone. Wow, that's pretty incredible. It seems like growth hormone therapy could be a real game changer for healthy aging. It could. But I have a feeling you were about to tell me there's a catch. <laughs> you know me too well. Right. As with any powerful substance, especially hormones, there are potential downsides to consider. Okay, so let's hear them. What kind of side effects are we talking about? Some of the reported side effects of growth hormone therapy include things like glucose intolerance, okay. edema, which is swelling caused by fluid retention, and carpal tunnel syndrome. Those sound pretty unpleasant. Are they permanent? The good news is that many of these side effects seem to go away once the treatment has stopped. Okay. But as always, the potential benefits and risks need to be carefully weighed on an individual basis, ideally with guidance from a doctor. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like self-treating with powerful hormones is probably not the best idea. I completely agree. It's crucial to work with a medical professional who can monitor your progress and adjust your treatment as needed. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. So we've talked about testosterone, resveratrol, and growth hormone. Right. What other fascinating substances are on our list for today? Well, let's shift gears and explore a newer class of drugs that aim to provide the benefits of androgens, like testosterone, but with potentially fewer side effects. Uh, okay. Have you heard of SARMs? SARMs. That's a new one for me. Yeah. What's that stand for? Oh. SARMs stands for Selective Androgen Receptor Modulators. Wow. Okay. They're designed to be more targeted in their action binding to androgen receptors in specific tissues like muscles and bones, while sparing other areas like the prostate which is a major concern with traditional testosterone therapy. So they're like a more precise tool for reaping the benefits without triggering all the unwanted side effects. Exactly. And early studies have shown some really promising results. Okay, I'm intrigued. What kind of results are we talking about? We've seen increases in muscle mass and strength in both men and women, improvements in bone density, and even some promising findings in preventing muscle wasting. 
It's definitely an area of research that's worth keeping an eye on. It sounds almost too good to be true. I know, right? Is there a catch? Well, the research on SARMs is still in its early stages. Okay. We need more long-term studies to fully understand their safety and effectiveness. Gotcha. But the initial findings are definitely encouraging. Okay. I can see why you're excited about it. Yeah. All right. So for our final deep dive today, let's get a little more cellular. Okay. You mentioned something earlier called MTOR. Ah, yes, MTOR, or the mammalian target of rapamycin. Mm. It's a cellular pathway that plays a crucial role in growth and aging. Okay. Think of it as a central hub that regulates a wide range of cellular processes. So like a control center for our cells. Exactly. What kind of processes are we talking about? MTOR is involved in things like protein synthesis, cell growth, and even something called autophagy. Autophagy. I've never heard that term before. Yeah. What's it's, that exactly? It's essentially the cell's recycling system. It's a process where cells break down and get rid of damaged components, which helps to keep things running smoothly and efficiently. So how does this MTOR pathway fit into the bigger picture of aging? What's really fascinating is that inhibiting the MTOR pathway has actually been shown to extend lifespan in various organisms, from simple yeast and worms all the way to mice. Wait, so by slowing down this pathway, they've actually increased lifespan? Yeah. That's incredible. It is pretty remarkable, and it's led to a lot of excitement about the potential of MTOR inhibitors as a future anti-aging intervention for humans. It's definitely pushing the boundaries of what we thought was possible. Right. Wow. This has been an incredibly informative dive into these substances so far. Yeah. It's amazing to think about the possibilities, but also, you know, important to be aware of the potential downsides. Absolutely. And it underscores the need for a holistic approach to aging. It's not just about finding a magic pill or therapy. It's about making healthy lifestyle choices, managing stress, and staying physically active. So it's not just about adding something new, but also about optimizing what's already there. Exactly. Gotcha. And speaking of optimization, okay. we haven't even touched upon how these substances could be used to enhance athletic performance. You're right. That's a whole other layer to this discussion. Well, it, it is. is. And it brings up even more questions about ethics, safety, and what it means to push the limits of human potential. But I think that's a conversation for our next deep dive. Okay, cliffhanger. I can't wait to hear more about that. But for now, I'm already feeling like I've learned a ton. Me too. It's always fascinating to explore the cutting edge of science and consider the potential implications for the future of human health. Totally. It makes you realize how important it is to stay curious and keep learning. Couldn't agree more. Okay, so picking up where we left off, let's explore how these substances can be used to enhance athletic performance. Okay. It's a topic that's both fascinating and ethically complex. I'm all ears. Let's start with testosterone. As we age, our natural levels decline, right. and that can impact our athletic abilities. Strength, endurance, recovery time, yeah. all of these can be affected. So would supplementing with testosterone give older athletes an edge? Theoretically, yes. Some studies have shown that testosterone replacement therapy can increase muscle mass and strength, improve oxygen uptake, and even reduce recovery time after intense workouts. Hmm. That sounds like it could be a real game changer for athletes trying to stay competitive as they get older. It could be. But it's important to remember that testosterone is a banned substance in most competitive sports. Right. And for good reason. It creates an uneven playing field and can be detrimental to an athlete's long-term health, if not used responsibly. So it's a performance enhancer, but not without its ethical and health implications. Exactly. And that's why it's crucial for athletes to work closely with medical professionals who understand the nuances of hormone therapy and the regulations surrounding its use in sports. All right, so let's shift gears to resveratrol. Okay. We talked about its potential health benefits. Right. But can it also enhance athletic performance? There's some evidence to suggest it might. Studies have shown that resveratrol can improve endurance in animal models, possibly by increasing mitochondrial function. Mitochondrial function. Yeah, those are the powerhouses of our cells. Right, okay. So it's like giving our cells a boost of energy. That's a simplified way of putting it, but yes. Okay. However, the research in humans is still limited. We need more studies to confirm whether these benefits translate to real-world athletic performance. Okay, so what about growth hormone? Could that help athletes push their limits? Growth hormone has long been considered a performance-enhancing drug, but its use is also banned in most sports. Right. While some studies have shown it can increase muscle mass and strength, reduce body fat, and even improve bone density, the evidence is mixed and there are significant risks involved. Yeah, you're talking about those side effects we discussed earlier. Right. Like glucose intolerance and carpal tunnel syndrome. Yes. 
Those are definitely concerns. And there's also the risk of acromegaly. Acromegaly. A condition where bones and tissues grow abnormally. Wow, that sounds serious. It seems like the risks might outweigh the potential benefits when it comes to growth hormone. For most athletes, yes. The risks associated with its use are significant, and the potential for long-term health consequences is real. Okay, let's talk about those newer drugs, uh, SARMs. Okay. You mentioned they might provide benefits similar to testosterone, but with fewer side effects. Right. Could they be a viable option for athletes? SARMs are definitely an area of interest in the world of sports performance. They're designed to be more selective in their action, targeting muscle and bone tissue while minimizing impact on other organs like the prostate. So potentially fewer side effects. Potentially, yeah. And a more targeted approach to muscle growth. That's the theory. But just like with any performance-enhancing substance, there are concerns about potential long-term health risks. Right. And importantly, SARMs are also banned substances in most sports. Right. It seems like... Staying ahead of the regulations is a constant battle for athletes and sporting organizations. It definitely is. And as scientists develop new and more sophisticated performance-enhancing drugs, the ethical and regulatory challenges become even more complex. So it's a, it's a moving target. It is. Okay. Well, it's clear that there's a lot to consider when it comes to performance enhancement. Yeah. It's not just about finding something that works. It's about weighing the risks, considering the ethics and understanding the rules of the game. Exactly. And... Ultimately, the decision of whether or not to use any kind of performance-enhancing substance is a personal one, but it's a decision that should be made with full awareness of the potential consequences. Absolutely. Okay, so we've talked about the potential benefits and risks of these substances, both in terms of aging and athletic performance. Right. But let's zoom out a bit and talk about the bigger picture. Okay. What are some of the ethical considerations surrounding the use of anti-aging and performance-enhancing drugs in general? That's a really important question. It's a topic that sparks a lot of debate and raises a whole bunch of ethical dilemmas. Like what kind of dilemmas? Well, for starters, there's the quote of fairness. Okay. Is it fair for some people to have access to these substances while others don't? Right. And if these substances become widely available, will it create a society where everyone feels pressured to use them just to keep up? I can see how that could become a real issue. Almost like a new kind of arms race where everyone's trying to get ahead. Exactly. And then there are questions about safety. As we've discussed, many of these substances have social side effects. Yeah. And we don't always fully understand the long-term implications of their use. Especially since the research is still ongoing for a lot of these substances, right? Yes, exactly. And then there are the deeper philosophical questions about what it means to age and what our goal should be as a society. Right. Are we striving for endless youth? Mm. Or are there other, perhaps more meaningful ways to define a fulfilling and successful life? It's almost like we're redefining what it means to be human. In a way, yes. And it's crucial to have these conversations and consider the potential societal implications of our choices. So on the topic of societal implications, mm -hmm. what about the regulations surrounding these substances? Right. Is there any oversight? The regulations vary widely depending on the substance and the country. Okay. Some substances are tightly controlled, requiring prescriptions and careful monitoring by medical professionals. Others are more easily accessible, available over the counter or even online. It seems like a bit of a wild west out there, especially with the internet, making it easier to access things that might not be legal or safe. It definitely adds another layer of complexity. Yeah. And it underscores the need for education and responsible use. People need to be aware of the potential risks and make informed decisions about their health. Okay, so let's bring it back to our deep dive today. We've talked about testosterone, resveratrol, growth hormone, SARMs, and mTOR. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of ground to cover. It is. And it's just a glimpse into the rapidly evolving world of anti-aging and performance enhancing substances. It's amazing to think about how much scientific progress has been made in this area. It is. Aren't but it? as with any powerful technology, it's important to use it wisely and ethically. Well said. Now, I'm curious to hear your perspective on this. OK. Out of all the substances we've discussed today, which one are you personally most excited about? That's a tough question. They each hold so much potential, but if I had to choose, I'd say I'm particularly intrigued by the research on MTOR inhibitors. The idea that we might be able to slow down the aging process at a cellular level is incredibly exciting. Yeah, I agree. That's a real game changer. What about you? Anything that's particularly caught your attention? Hmm. You know, I think the whole idea of personalized medicine is fascinating. Yeah, well. Tailoring treatments to an individual's unique genetic 
makeup and lifestyle. Life. It feels like we're on the cusp of a revolution in healthcare. Absolutely. The more we understand about the complexities of the human body, the better equipped we'll be to develop targeted and effective therapies. This has been an incredibly insightful deep dive into the world of anti-aging and performance-enhancing drugs. It's given me a lot to think about. Me too. And remember, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Right. There's so much more to explore and learn as this field continues to evolve. Okay, before we completely wrap up. Okay. I wanted to circle back to something we touched upon earlier, uh, testosterone replacement therapy. Yeah. We talked about the potential benefits and risks. Right. But I'm curious about the practical side of things. Yeah. What does the process of getting testosterone therapy actually look like? It typically starts with a consultation with a medical professional who specializes in hormone therapy. Okay. They'll take a detailed medical history, perform a physical exam, and order blood tests to check your hormone levels. So it's not just a matter of walking into a clinic and saying, hey, I want testosterone. Not at all. It's a medical treatment that needs to be carefully considered and monitored. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So what are the different ways testosterone can be administered? There are several options, each with its own pros and cons. Okay. There are injections, which are typically given every one to two weeks. There are transdermal patches or gels, which are applied to the skin daily. And there are even implantable pellets that release testosterone slowly over time. It sounds like finding the right method is a, a bit of a Goldilocks situation. Right. Not too fast, not too slow, but just right. Exactly. And the doctor will work with you to determine the best approach based on your individual needs and preferences. Yeah, right. that makes sense. Mm. Well, this has been an incredibly informative dive into the world of testosterone and all its complexities. It has. And I think it highlights the importance of approaching any kind of hormone therapy with caution and careful consideration. Absolutely. Knowledge is power. And I feel much more empowered to have these conversations and make informed decisions. That's what we hope to achieve with these deep dives to empower people with the knowledge they need to navigate this complex and ever-evolving landscape. Well, on that note, it's probably time to wrap up part two of our deep dive. Okay. I'm already looking forward to part three, where we can delve into some of the listener-submitted questions we've received on this topic. Me too. It's always great to hear from our listeners and address their specific interests and concerns. Until then, stay curious. Aww. All right, so welcome back to our deep dive into anti-aging and performance-enhancing drugs. Okay. We've covered a lot of ground. But now it's time to tackle some listener questions. Okay, sounds good. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, so the first question comes from a listener who's curious about the long-term effects of testosterone replacement therapy. Okay. They want to know if there are any studies that have tracked the health outcomes of men who've been on TRT for, say, 10 years or more. That's a really important question, and it's one that researchers are still working to answer definitively. Okay. While there have been many studies looking at the short-term effects of TRT, long-term data is still somewhat limited. Some studies have followed men on TRT for 5 to 10 years, but tracking health outcomes over even longer periods is challenging. Yeah, I can imagine it would be a logistical feat to keep track of participants over such a long time. It really is. But what about the studies that have been done so far? What have they found? Well, some of the longer-term studies have shown that TRT can continue to provide benefits like increased muscle mass, improved bone density, and better mood for several years. However, there's also evidence suggesting that the risks of certain side effects like prostate problems and cardiovascular issues may increase over time. So it sounds like the jury's still out on the truly long-term effects of TRT. Yeah, pretty much. It's a balancing act. It is. Weighing the potential benefits against the potential risks. Exactly. And that's why it's crucial for anyone considering TRT to have ongoing conversations with their doctor, monitor their health closely, and be aware of any changes or potential red flags. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. Our next question comes from a listener who's asking about resveratrol. Okay. They've heard that it's found in red wine. Right. But they're not a big wine drinker. So they're wondering if there are other ways to get resveratrol, maybe through supplements or certain foods. That's a common question. And it's understandable given the attention red wine gets when it comes to resveratrol. Right. While red wine is a source of resveratrol, you'd have to drink a lot of it to reach the levels used in some of the studies. So probably not the best strategy. Probably. For boosting your resveratrol intake. What about supplements? Yeah. Are those a viable option? Resveratrol supplements are readily available, but it's important to be cautious with them. As we discussed earlier, some formulations can have cytotoxic effects, meaning they can be 
toxic to cells. Right. And resveratrol can interact with certain medications, so it's essential to talk to your doctor before starting any new supplements. Okay, so supplements are an option, but require caution and medical guidance. Absolutely. What about foods? Are there any dietary sources of resveratrol besides red wine? Yes, there are. Resveratrol is actually found in the skins of grapes, so red grapes and grape juice can provide some resveratrol. Okay. It's also found in berries, like blueberries and cranberries and even peanuts and pistachios. Wow. Okay. So incorporating those foods into your diet could be a good way to increase your resveratrol intake naturally. Exactly. No need to become a sommelier just yet. Right. All right. What other questions on our list? The next one is from a listener who's asking about growth hormone and its potential for improving sleep quality. Okay. They've read that growth hormone is released during sleep and that declining levels might contribute to age-related sleep problems. That's interesting. I've definitely noticed my own sleep patterns changing as I've gotten older. Is there any truth to the connection between growth hormone and sleep? There is some evidence to suggest that growth hormone plays a role in regulating sleep patterns. Yeah. Growth hormone is indeed released in pulses during sleep, particularly during deep sleep stages. As we age, these pulses become smaller and less frequent, which might contribute to the lighter, more fragmented sleep that many older adults experience. So there's a potential link. There is. But does that mean supplementing with growth hormone could improve sleep quality? That's where things get a bit trickier. While some studies have shown that growth hormone therapy can increase the amount of deep sleep, other studies have shown mixed results. And as we discussed earlier, there are potential risks associated with growth hormone therapy. Right. Those side effects like glucose intolerance and carpal tunnel syndrome. Exactly. So probably not worth messing with your hormones just to get a few extra Zs. Probably not. What other questions do we have? Here's an interesting one. This listener is asking about the potential for these substances to be used to address cognitive decline in conditions like Alzheimer's disease. That's a really important topic and one that's close to many people's hearts. It is. Are there any promising avenues of research in that area? There are. Researchers are exploring the potential of various substances, including testosterone, growth hormone, and even resveratrol to slow down or even reverse cognitive decline in neurodegenerative diseases. So could these substances potentially hold the key to preventing or treating Alzheimer's? It's too early to say for sure, but there are some intriguing hints. For example, some small studies have suggested that testosterone therapy might improve cognitive function in men with mild Alzheimer's disease, and there's evidence that growth hormone might play a role in protecting brain cells from damage. That's definitely hopeful. But I imagine there's still a long way to go before these substances become standard treatments for Alzheimer's. Yeah, it's definitely an area of active investigation, but more research is needed. All right, we have time for one more question. Okay. This listener is asking about the future of anti-aging research. Okay. They're wondering what exciting developments we might see in the next five to 10 years. That's a great question to end on. The field of anti-aging research is incredibly dynamic right now with new discoveries happening all the time. Yeah, for sure. I think we can expect to see even more targeted therapies, perhaps using nanotechnology to deliver drugs directly to specific cells or tissues. That sounds like science fiction. You know, right? What else? I think we'll also see a greater emphasis on personalized medicine, using genetic testing and other biomarkers to tailor treatments to an individual's unique needs. And there's a growing interest in the role of the microbiome, the trillions of bacteria that live in our gut in influencing aging and longevity. So maybe the secret to a longer life lies within our own gut. That's fascinating. It is. And it just goes to show that we're only just beginning to unravel the mysteries of aging. Well, this has been an incredible deep dive into the world of anti-aging and performance-enhancing drugs. We've explored the science, the potential benefits and risks, the ethical considerations, and even peeked into the future of this rapidly evolving field. It has been quite a journey. I hope you found it as fascinating and informative as I have. Me too. It's been a pleasure discussing all of this with you. And remember, the most important thing is to stay curious, keep learning, and make informed decisions about your own health and well-being. Well said. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on The Deep Dive.